webinar providing scientific highlights of the forthcoming 47th Union World Conference on Lung Health in Liverpool, UK later this month. Let us remember the promises our governments have made by adopting the Sustainable Development Goals at last year's UN General Assembly, one of which is to end tuberculosis by 2030. The WHO Global Tuberculosis Report was just released last week. And we all look forward to learning more about the latest in fight against TB from our experts in this webinar. It is of utmost importance to ensure that TB rates are declining and declining fast enough so as to keep every country on track to TB by 2030 or even earlier. Our webinar panel of experts will share more. But before that, let me make a few quick announcements. All, particip all participants are requested to please send us your questions while the panelists present. Just type your questions in using the chat function or raise your virtual hand you will see on your screen. We will take up these questions during the question and answer session. I also request all panelists to please present in time so that we have good enough time left for questions and answers. Thanks for your cooperation. Without any further ado, let me welcome today's webinar moderator, Ashok Ram Suroop, who is a senior and widely acclaimed award-winning journalist based in Durban, South Africa. He has more than 42 years of rich experience in journalism. Mahatma Gandhi's granddaughter, Ela Gandhi, and Citizen News Service had conferred upon him the Health Justice Lifetime Media Lifetime Achievement Award in Durban in July 2016. Over to you, Ashok Ramsuru. South Africa has been battling HIV as well as TB, but the latest World Health Organization Global TB report released last week shows that we have a long way ahead before we could end both AIDS and TB. Six countries globally that account for 60% of all cases include South Africa, the remaining five are India, Indonesia, China, Nigeria and Pakistan. Almost most shocking to me was to learn that instead of declining, TB deaths rose. 1.8 million people died from TB including 400,000 who were co-infected with HIV as per latest WHO Global TB report. TB was one of the top causes of death worldwide in 2015 ranking above HIV and malaria. This is unacceptable because TB is preventable and curable. No one needs to die of TB. Well, let us listen to our panelists today on what are the top scientific highlights of the forthcoming 47th Union World Conference on Lung Health, which will open in Liverpool later this month. Well, let me bring or rather, let me introduce the panel of experts, Diana Wheel, Coordinator, Policy Strategy and Innovations Unit, WHO Global TB Program, Grenier Brigden 3P Project, led from the International Union Against TB and Lung Disease, the Union. Dr. Jose Pepe Caminero, Head of MDR TB Unit of the International Union Against TB, and lung disease, the union. Uh, today's webinar becomes more special because Dr. Jose Caminero of the union has been featured before on CNS webinars. Well, let me introduce, or rather, let me welcome Diana Veal from the World Health Organization Global TV Program. She is a coordinator for policy, strategy, and innovations at the WHO. CNS first met her almost a decade 
ago, and she was one of the few voices on TV and human rights. Thankfully, welcome, Diana, and over to you now. Hello, Diana. Hello. Oh, yes. We just confirmed. Yes, yes, Am I yes, on? Yes, yes. Okay. Yes. I'm. I'm sorry. We just had a problem with our mute button. Thank you so much, okay. and thank you for um, for hosting this webinar. Um, it's great to be with you, and um, it's great timing um, because we had, as you've noted, the launch of our Global TV Report last week, um, which received, thankfully, a good coverage worldwide um, on the situation of the global TB epidemic and uh, the long way we need to go for a full-fledged response to the epidemic and uh, to move at the pace we need to to end the epidemic by 2030. Um, I wanted to just reiterate something that was set up front um, and make a little bit of a clarification. The burden of disease for TB through our analysis of available survey data um, and surveillance information um, has been re-estimated upward. So the estimate of the burden of disease has gone up both in terms of cases and deaths. Um, that's based largely on uh, new data available from India. And you may have seen an article in The Lancet from the Minister of Health of India along with the regional director of WHO in the Southeast Asia region that reinforces the importance of Asia for responding to the epidemic um, and, of course, the, the tremendous importance of the high rates of TB in Africa. I just want to clarify that while our burden estimates have gone up, our estimates of the trend is still downward, both for incidents and deaths. But that trend line is woefully slow. For incidence, it's 1.5% per year, far from the 4 to 5% we need to be running at by 2020 to be on track um, toward ending the epidemic by 2030. So we're very disturbed that we haven't seen the acceleration that we need to see in the last two years, and we, we need to see more um, in, that, in that space. And we also it very much in the report reinforced the MDR crisis is still with us. We still have huge gaps in the number of people, people reaching care, both for drug sensitive but also particularly for MDR treatment, despite the availability of diagnostics and drugs that we can use to serve the people being affected. Um, so on the topic of the union's um, proposal for this seminar, I just wanted to highlight quickly one one item, and I'm not sure if people are seeing the screen. Are you seeing the screen? Yes. Yeah. Okay. All right. So we have basically, we just wanted to say that we have a roadmap that is going up on our website that we, we look to all to, to look to shortly that will give you the roadmap of all WHO activities associated in advance of the Union Congress conference, which we're so excited that the Liverpool conference is being organized by the Union as every year it gives us a tremendous opportunity for networking among our partners and with countries and to review the scientific progress. So we hope this is a bigger and, and, and better conference than every year before. So we have um, one of the preeminent things that we do at the Union Conference um, on the invitation of the Union is to give a global um, conference um, on on the global TB response. So we, it's called the NTB Summit, I mean the NTB Symposium um, that we organize and this year our focus is on the principal focus of the morning session is on Know Your Epidemic. We'll start the day that morning with, with our colleagues from Catherine Floyd who runs our epi uh, surveillance team who will give an overview of the global TB epidemic and that's going to be critical for everybody to place us just reminding us what just came out of that global TB report. And then the focus of the meeting I'm going to tell you is really around two th uh, three things. So we review the status of the global epidemic, where we are broadly on the role 
goal out of the NTB strategy and the sustainable development goals um, and associated financing linked to the global plan to stop TB to 2020. And we'll be looking particularly with a speech from Mario Riglioni around the opportunities offered by innovation. So really for journalists it'll be an interesting opportunity to be thinking about how is the TV community and the TV scientists linking into the broader trends of the Internet of Things, e-health, um, communications technologies, other technologies that are being used in other, um, in other areas, as well as the traditional areas of the research and development pipelines for TB. So we give a broad overview in the morning on that. We're then going to be discussing through a series of presentations the steps being taken um, it, to better know the epidemic. What does it mean to know your epidemic um, for TB? We know that phrase from the HIV community. We know the power of that phrase to understand that it's not just a statistics, but it's who's being affected, where do they live, um, what are the variations inside countries in the epidemic, um, and how do we respond to that information as we make our strategic response. So we're excited by the chance to have that dialogue, to have a variety of people speaking around that agenda and I'll show you quickly that, that those agenda points. Um, we then will have a session that really highlights what key constituencies are doing as groups to respond to ending TB and this year that will include parliamentarians, the global caucus of TB parliamentarians, we have um, we will have the NTB, uh, TB, NT, <laughs> National TB Program Managers who will be reporting back on a major summit we're having next weekend of the 30 highest burden countries for them to um, communicate across each other about some of the key challenges in rolling out new tools, in measuring the epidemics, and in, in driving the domestic financing as well as global financing need, needed to respond. And we'll also have um, a session of civil society um, partners who are part of the WHO Global Task Force re representing civil society to talk about what they're doing and promoting and the declaration they made a year ago on the role of civil society in pushing the agenda and engaging with national programs and being invited to engage in monitoring and evaluation and design of programs. And we have then a major agenda around um, research, which basically is the later afternoon will be spent about some of the major research themes around new tools um, and operational research. So the agenda is rich and we hope is just a highlight before we go into the main conference when all of these topics will be dealt with in much more detail. So you can go to the Union website to see the, the global um, the Global TB Symposium um, agenda. Um, we'll also have it on our website, and I can I can speak to any of the agenda uh, 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 different agenda items um, individually because I think it's hard on this screen to see those individual items. We also I want to highlight for the journalists one last thing, which we will be having a number of releases of new documents in um, in uh, at the conference. And these include um, our plan um, that we hope that we'll be able to release new guidelines that have been um, drafted uh, with expert input on the use of delaminid in children, which is a key drug um, to address serious forms of MDR-TB. And clearly, we've always been concerned that children are reached last with new drugs and resources. And we hope that getting this guidance out will enable children to be among those that are the first to be receiving these new drugs for MDR. Um, so that's one major thing that we'll be putting out. We're putting out this week new framework for indicators for laboratory strengthening that our technical partners will be looking at. We'll also be looking at um, a new um, partnership to improve the database around um, drug, dr drug, drug interactions and drug safety concerns, which is a major concern worldwide that most low-income countries don't have the capacity to do careful monitoring. So building a global database that it can assist everybody to learn from what we're learning and the use of new drugs and existing drugs will be important. We're also going to be talking about our collaborative work on zoonotic TB that we are conducting with the, with the union as well as with the um, World Organization of Animal Health and other colleagues. Um, we'll also be discussing a toolkit on um, 
on uh, uh, TB research um, TB research planning and how countries can pursue their national strategic plans and research. We'll be putting out a Nature magazine TB primer, which is basically the A to Z, the basics of TB for scientists and academics, uh, which will be coming out in collaboration with others such as McGill University. And we'll also be speaking to the progress around utilizing and technical guidance around using x-ray to better use, which is an underutilized resource for screening and diagnosis in TB. So we're excited about really bringing um, prominence again to the role of x-ray alongside other new, uh, alongside newer diagnostics. So that's pretty much what we'll be highlighting. We have many, many symposium we're involved in along with collaborators and our, and our, um, our overview provides background on that. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, that was Diana Real, Co Coordinator, Policy Strategy and Innovations Unit, WHO Global TB Program. This is perfect stage to now invite Grenya Brigden, who is leading the 3P project at the International Union Against TB and Lung Disease for the Union. 3P stands for Push, Pull and Pull which is a new approach to developing affordable and effective new drug regimes, regimens to treat TB. CNS has interviewed Grenya a few times over the years when she was advisor for TB and antimicrobial microbial resistance for medicines sans frontiers access campaign. Welcome Grenya and over to you now. Thank you. Um, I'm just seeing if I can share my slides. Okay, hopefully you can see. Okay, can everyone see my slides? Yes. Oh, okay, excellent. Yes, okay. Right, okay, so um, just to give a little background as a, as just been said so I'm a TB doctor and I have I'm working I've worked in the UK and Uganda um, and I've really focused mainly on uh, drug resistant TB over the last couple of years in my time from working in Uganda and with the MSF access campaign um, and I'm now taking this forward to look at the future for treatments for TB so I've picked out some of the highlights that are focusing on drug resistant TB treatment challenges at this year's union conference and sort of put them into three areas so really the need for better regimens and to scale up the use of new drugs the importance of having the right policies in place and the need to plan for the future mainly concentrating on some of the R&D sessions so research and development sessions into the new into new future drugs vaccines and regimens of the future so this is just sort of some of the the main focus from the new drugs um, is the is that there's a lot of sessions at this year's conference on the use of bedaquilin and delaminid, which, as you may know, are the two new drugs that have recently been registered for the, the treatment of MDR and XDR TB. Um, and this is just really to show that although there's a lot of sessions talking about the use of these new drugs, um, we're still far from reaching what we need to, how frequently we need to be using these new drugs. And it is very welcome, the, the guidance there that Diana was talking about on the use of delaminid in children. So I, as far as I'm aware, you're going to get the uh, slides, so I'm not going to sort of focus too long on this, but really just to point out that there's a number of sessions on, on the um, new drugs, and a lot of them are looking at the various aspects and challenges of programmatically using the new drugs of uh, bedaquilin and delaminid. Um, the MSF satellite and the NTB symposium will be looking at how MSF has used these new drugs in slightly novel ways, so the use of them in children, extending the duration and combining them. Um, and the NTB program will be looking at uh, 
the use of these drugs in specific places such as Armenia, Peru, Lesotho and Georgia. And Georgia. Um, I think it will be very interesting the TB Alliance uh, uh, symposium on Thursday evening because again they will be presenting or talking about some of their trials of another new drug called protominid that's not yet been registered for the use uh, for MDRTB but there's a number of uh, trials that have, are beginning to produce results on this so I think this will be a very interesting session um, and as well with the tag symposium which is outside the program uh, we'll also be looking at ways that we can move treatment forward um, and as I said, there's a lot of sessions on this, so there's continuing on Friday and Saturday. Um, and I think uh, it'll be also picking up on uh, the new approaches to MDR treatment in children. So this will also be looking at some of the practical experience of using the new drugs in children uh, to complement the guidelines. Um, and then on this Saturday, I think I would definitely recommend attending the Union CDC Late Breaker session on um, TB, as this will be presenting the first data from an oral regimen for XDR TB called the NICS trial, as well as some very interesting data on the uh, nine-month regimen that the WHO released guidance on earlier this year. Again, in the student late breaker, there's quite a bit on the short course regimen and the new drugs, which will be very interesting is that this is data that's really quite up to date. Um, and again, there's a full session on the shortened regimens for the treatment of MDR-TB. So this is looking at um, a nine-month regimen instead of the two-year regimen for drug-resistant forms of TB, which I think will be very interesting. Um, then going to sort of what my next uh, theme was, was that the policies are in place. So as Diana says, the WHO have had a number of policies released and continuing to be released, which are really pushing forward um, how we should be treating TB. Um, and this is just some of the sessions that are pulling out the importance of implementing these uh, policies um, and the Meet the Experts session on Thursday is with an NTP manager from Belarus who will be talking about her practical experience of implementing new policies on both diagnostics and drugs um, and again the uh, importance of the involvement of policy makers and parliament and pushing forward uh, the political agenda on TB. Um, so those are a number of sessions that I think would be very interesting to attend if that's uh, where your interest is. Um, and then looking at the future drugs, vaccines and regimens, so uh, as uh, Diana says, the WHO some symposium in the afternoon will be focusing um, on the advances of TB research and the rollout of these innovations um, and it's also going to be the launch of the Treatment Action Group R&D report on Tuesday which will be outlining some of the funding trends um, with regards to who is funding and how much is being funded in research and development in all areas of TB. Um, again, there's some really interesting looking stuff on both treatment and vaccines on the Thursday um, and the special session on Friday uh, looks at sort of how we can bring forward the innovations. Um, so, and just finally to really talk about what I'm doing now and we'll be talking about at the WHO's symposium on Wednesday on Tuesday is the um, this 3P project. So this is looking at a really new and innovative way of doing research and development in TB that will not only uh, sort of build on the advances we've made 
so far with the new drugs we've got, but making sure that we continue to get companies and developers to invest in TB and reward them adequately and also move towards developing regimens a lot earlier in the pipeline so that the, any new drugs we have will be developed as regimens aiming towards a one month or less uh, treatment regimen that works for everyone including children and HIV co-infected uh, and is available everywhere so it's affordable and appropriate um, so uh, I would recommend that you come along to the symposium on Tuesday afternoon to hear about this and other innovative uh, models for pushing forward innovation in R&D in TB. Thank you. Joining CNS webinar was Grenia Bridgeton, 3P project lead from the International Union Against TB and Lung Disease, the union. She put the spotlight on key issues confronting us today in context of ending TB by 2030. Last but not the least, let us now listen to Dr. Jose Caminero, head of MDR TB unit of the International Union Against TB and Lung Disease, the union. Welcome back, Jose, and over to you. Can I, okay, can you listen to me now? Listen to you clear. Yes, yes, okay. Yes. Okay, you yes, can see. You're very you. clear. Okay, okay. Uh, um, you, can you see also my my slides of, also? Yes. Yes, go Okay, okay. Yes. Thank you very much for the invitation. It's very nice for me to be with you again. Uh, uh, you know more or less all the different symposium in the next World Conference. I would like to address now a general view what is happening with the drug resistance in the world. This is I am calling toward MDRTB control in the world, especially because we need to increase the detection and cure rate of this patient. Probably everybody knows, but it is very important to, re to, um, to review what is the definition. Remember the definition of MDR is the, the resistant t the tuberculosis with resistant to at least isonazine recombitin. And this is very important because they are the two most important drugs we have until now to treat TB. And at the moment, the estimation is near uh, 500,000 new cases every year. For, the, for MDR and probably uh, 200,000 there. And also, also it's very important to review what is the definition of the XDR. The XDR is the same than, than MDR plus resistant to the most important secular drug, the fluorquinolones and the secular drug injectable. At the moment, the estimation is yearly we can have more or less 50,000 new cases yearly and 30,000 deaths. And this is the problem. Previously, we spoke what is the most important public health crisis at the moment in the world. Probably it is regarding the MDR. Because of this near 500,000 new cases we have every year, the detection is only around 25%. Starting treatment around 110,000 patients, more or less, this is around 25%, and curing only 50%. This is not enough. As you can see. At the moment, in thinking in the objective or the target of the NTB, the 90-90-19, remember we have to, the, to have the detection of the 90% of the TB cases. Remember, in the MDR TB at the moment, only 25%, and we have to cure 90%, and we are curing only 50%. Then with this situation, uh, we need to increase this uh, detection and this cure rate if we, if we are thinking uh, to control the MDRTB epidemic, because at the moment it is totally under control, the, this epidemic. And for the reason, the first question is how can we increase the TB and the MDRTB detection? And yes, we have at the moment one possibility, yes, to be for using Molecular rapid molecular DST, very sensitive DST. We are speaking about Genesper or even Genesper Ultra or similar. This is the only situation to increase the detection of the TB and the MDRTB. Also, of course, it could be also very important in we, if we can have, I don't know, it's not working now, my, my presentation now, I don't know. Okay, it's okay. Also, improve the health coverage of all the TB patients, but it is not, no, not possible at the moment. Then thinking about this, 
you know. At the moment, the most important is all the country can go with the Ginespere, widely used of Ginespere. And at the moment, we have some problem in many, many countries in the world. Remember, the Ginespere not only can support us for the detection of recombinant resistance, but also is increasing a lot the, the detection of the TB patient, because you know it is more sensitive than the smear. It's about more than it. But any, anyway, the most important probably is coming soon. It's coming soon, especially with the Ginespere only. This is, you can have in your hand. This is to, to, to take the, to, to carry the patient in the bed. This is very, very usual. And especially the Ginespere Ultra, because this Ginespere Ultra will be even more sensitive for increasing the detection in the TB and in the MDR TB. Probably this uh, Ultra, this is the Ginespere only, I told you before. This is probably this year will be available. The price is nearly 1000 US dollar. This is also only for one patient, but this is very, very useful. You can see you can use also the cellular phone for the detection. This is very, very, very practical to be with the patient. And also, as I told you before, the Inesper Ultra. The Inesper Ultra will be as, as, as uh, sensitive, uh, the sensitivity will be similar, similar to the uh, liquid culture. Uh, and this is the most sensitive that we have until now. This is, in my opinion, the only uh, possibility to increase the detection of the TB and the MDR TB. And also it is very important, not only thinking in the MDR. Remember I told you at the beginning, speaking about the XDR. Many patients with the MDR at the moment in the world, they are receiving the same standard regimen. And of course, the same, this standard regimen is working in many, many in most of the patients, but not in all. Many of the patients, they have, at the beginning, from the beginning, they have resistance to the fluorquinolone or the second energy table. The reason this recommendation WHO made 2016, in my opinion, are very, very, very important because this is very simple test you can use in most of the countries and only for a price of less than 10 US dollars from the beginning you will know if the patient with MDR, they have also resistant to the fluorquinolone and or the second industry table. In this situation, we can give to the patient from the beginning the best treatment that the patient needs. Okay? And this is regarding the, the, the detection. What is happening regarding the cure rate? If we are thinking to increase the current cure rate, we need to, to think in the shorter MDR TV regimen. Of course, we spoke before, also speaking about the new drug. I will speak a little also. Because remember, with the current MDR TV regimen we are using in the world, the higher successful outcome is lower than 50 to 60%. This is the slide of WHO. You can see here from 2007 to 2012, always is the same. The cure rate is always around 50%. Curing 50%, you can have also individual benefits, but not we cannot have in, we can have impacts impact in the in the control of the epidemic. And the situation even is worse when we are speaking about the XDR because the patient with XDR they are curing more or less only 30% of the patient, then we need to increase this uh, cure rate for all the patient. What is the problem? With the current regimen we are giving now, this is one medical NSF slide, the patient with MDR, they have to take near 50,000 pills for the treatment. This is for the reason many, many patients, when they have, we are improving a little, they are defaulting practically of them, and this is very big. Very logical, this is the default. Then for the reason we need the shorter regimen. The shorter regimen started with the investigation, with the research of the union. This is the first publication six years ago in Bangladesh showing that a nine month regimen could cure near 90% of the patient. In the last four or five years, there have been some other publications and some other research of the union in many, many countries, especially in the French African countries, showing that this uh, shorter regimen can work in most of the MDR TB patients. And for the reason, I am very happy because in May also WHO has accepted this shorter regimen as one of the key recommendations for the patient with MDR. This is a nine month regimen with the capacity to near 90%. I am totally sure in the, in the next uh, World Conference, we will speak a lot about this shorter regimen. But in my opinion, most of the MDR TB patients in the world can receive this shorter regimen. Increasing the Q rate, this is very important. You can see here, this is the WHO publication showing that the shorter regimen can cure much more than the conventional regimen. Even if the patient is totally susceptible to all the second line that, but even if the patient has some resistance 
to the sequelae that or even to pyrazinamide. For the short regimen should be the idea. At the moment, I think we have to, in all the world, to start with this short regimen, at least in the patient without resistance to the fluorquinolone and sequelae in the table. But also, we have in a very near, near future, what is the mm, support of the new drugs, especially linezolid, vedaculin, and the lamanid, because they are very, very good new drugs. And remember, the estimation for many organizations, international organizations, even for the union, is probably every year at that moment with the current situation we have in the world, around 33,000 to 55,000, they should receive this new drug. At that moment, you can see in the last reports, you can see here that Vedaculin, they are receiving Vedaculin in the world, less than 2,000 patients, and the Lamanid, less than 500, less than 500 patients. This is not enough. At that moment, with the current situation, probably near 50% 50,000 of the patients with MDR, probably they, they need this new drug. And don't forget, speaking the new drug, Lainesolid is a very good drug. We are speaking very little about Lainesolid. Lainesolid had a very good bacterial activity, very good extralization, extralization activity. It's very good for the prevention of resistance, and also the problem could be the toxicity, but the toxicity can be very good. Uh, you can address more or less well, you are reducing the doses, and you are asking some very uh, simple question, key question to the patient, okay? This is the same for the Dacoli. Very good bacterial uh, activity, probably also very good extralization activity, with the limited data we have until now, probably is also very good for the prevention of resistance in a convention in a combination regimen. Okay, and the toxicity, many people speaking about the QTC prolongation, but we are working with these drugs in the field, and this is very, very uncommon. You can control also also very well. And also the last one, the lamanid, the lamanid, also very good battery field, probably even better. Esterilization also very good because it's working in an heroic uh, static culture model. Also, for the same for the prevention of resistance and the same for the, for the toxicity. They are three very good drugs. Maybe we have to think also to use all these drugs for all the TB patients from the beginning for susceptible, monoresistant, MDR, XDR, because they are out of the current definition about MDR and XDR. And this is, this is the future, and we need a lot of clinical trials showing that these drugs can work very well with on the, all the TB patients. Not only MDR, but also susceptible TB patient. Then my conclusion is, fortunately, in the last five, six years, we have had a lot of advance in diagnosis, especially the GNSPR, the molecular ter, the real-time PCR. And at the moment, we need wider implementation in all the world about the GNSPR to increase the detection of the TB and also MDR TB. And also coming soon, the only, the portable and ultra higher sensitivity gene expert, and also the LPA, I, I spoke to you before, for sequelae that. This is very important to support and to identify the XDR and to give the best regimen from the beginning to all the patients. And regarding the treatment, we need that all the shorter MDRT regimen, 9-12 months, increase in implementation in the world, practically in all the world, and also to, to see what is the role of the new drugs, like Nesoli, Vedapolin, and the Lamanid. I am totally sure these drugs are very good, and they will work much, much better than we are thinking until now. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. That was uh, Dr. Jose Pepe Caminero, head of the MDR TB unit of the International Union Against TB, and lung disease. Well, you, have, you heard the experts have spoken out. It's now a good time to open the floor for Q&A. It's now over to Shobha, Madam G. Uh, thank you, Ashok. Uh, we have many questions pouring in for our panelists. Uh, the first question is for Diana, uh, and uh, it is from Parvez of Pakistan Tribune. Uh, he wants to know, that the WHO NTB strategy interim goal for 2020 also includes zero catastrophic costs. Now, in countries where TB care often drives people into poverty, how are we going to achieve this goal in the next three, four years? Thank you. 
Um, this is an outstanding question, and it really is one of the most ambitious um, elements that the World Health Assembly adopted in taking on the new NTB strategy. The notion behind that was, just as you said, there are just we know the strong evidence from most every country that has explored the questions of patient costs, both the costs of medical care in some cases, the indirect costs of seeking out care, transport, nutrition, other elements, as well as the income loss that's incurred both due to the illness um, as well as the help seeking and staying in care for the whole period of care um, and the acute needs also for MDR patients given the very se severity of their illness and, and the long period of treatment that, that catastrophic addressing these catastrophic burdens is, is central to the response to TB. It's certainly central to, to the sustainable development goals as eliminating poverty is one of the sustainable development goals and universal health coverage is another one of the targets of the Sustainable Development Goals, and that includes um, the, the removal of financial catastrophic burdens for anyone facing health care. Um, so TB, we thought in, in, in de developing this strategy along with all of our partners, um, and then in the World Health Assembly review of the strategy, that the only barrier to removing catastrophic costs is financial. Um, we, we know we can do it. We know we can extend services if we have the resources, if countries have the resources. We know we can make care more accessible to patients by doing community-based care, by using their families and colleagues to help them get through care. We know we can use better diagnostics so people don't have to come back repeatedly to health services. We know that we can use social protection schemes that help the poor in many countries, and TB patients are among the poor most often, that we could access more social benefits. And we know that many TB patients can do, I mean, TB programs can do better with the social support that they provide at health services to patients, whether it's transport vouchers or other means to help reduce those costs. So we said, there is no epidemiological reason, there's no reason we should wait 15 years to achieve this. So we have to set this very ambitious goal of 2020. We know it's highly ambitious and not all countries will be able to possibly achieve it, but we want everyone to try and everyone should be able to if the attention was given to it. So addressing the broad universal health coverage agenda that we have to address across diseases. But part of it is specific, as I've noted, to TB. And one of the first things we're doing with countries is helping countries do, if they haven't done them already, baseline surveys of TB patients to have a sense of what is the nature of those expenses. And our global TB report this year, if you look at the report online, includes some content on what are we trying to do with these surveys and what are the kinds of expenses people are incurring. And then some of the responses that we're recommending. So I think we have an ambitious schedule, an ambitious agenda, but it's really the heart that TB is a disease linked to poverty and seeking care and staying in care can impoverish people. So we need to respond. Okay, thank you, Diana. Uh, I request the participants to please keep sending your questions using the chat function or by raising your virtual hand on the webinar screen. Uh, we have a question for Grania. Grania, thanks so much for uh, driving us through the program. Uh, many of the journalists, uh, participants want to know if the sessions at the union conference, which you have mentioned in particular, will be webcasted live. And uh, if yes, uh, can uh, people who are not able to be on site be able to attend that and ask questions live? Thank you for the question. Um, um, so I, I'm not sure maybe Jose can help, but as far as I'm aware, the, a lot, most of the sessions are recorded, but I'm not sure they're webinar live, but they become available on the website afterwards. Um, so I, yeah, I think I'm not sure that they're broadcast live, unfortunately. Okay. Okay, one more question, Rania. Thanks for engaging parliamentarians in the sessions. Uh, do we know which parliamentarians and from which countries are they coming? Uh, is, would you like to share that list with us or 
is it online or so because it's, many journalists want to know about mm, yes so i think there is a global tb caucus meeting of the europe I think the WHO Euro region, so I think there's a number of parliamentarians um, from the WHO Euro region. Um, I, I would recommend that the policymakers and partnerships session that is, a, that is on the Thursday afternoon at half one till three. I'll see if I can quickly bring up the agenda for that because that, that has got the names of some of the parliamentarians um, and from memory I think there is the Nick Herbert from the UK and there is um, a parliamentarian from Kenya but there are more but I just don't have the list offhand available now. I think Matt Oliver okay, from the... Yeah, I, I think I think probably Matt Oliver from the Global TB Caucus could could inform you better. Um, I'm aware some some number are coming early in the week, and I'm not sure how many are staying for how long. Um, but I think he is the person core groups and their and their meeting okay. schedules. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, we have Trisha Mahajan from Reach TB who wants to ask a question. Uh, Trisha, please ask your question. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, yes we can. Hi, uh, I have a question to Ms. Diana. Uh, what is being done for extra pulmonary TB and will R&D and iatrogenic interventions be focused on EPTB while addressing the NTB strategy? Yes, um, we actually, we, the, one of the premises of the NTB strategy and our treatment guidelines now is that we are focusing no longer just on um, special focus on the most infectious cases, which had been the focus in some previous um, decades and early in the um, rise of the global response. Um, clearly to NTB, we need to be sure um, that all pe people are being served. Um, our guidance has always addressed all patients, but we really want to give emphasis to programs being up to speed to be able to address extra pulmonary TB. And it's and it's it's true that we've we've given some attention also through zoonotic TB, which also leads to um, some extra pulmonary forms, to a greater attention to the the risk factors for TB. Um, on in terms of um, therapeutic guidance and response. Um, I have to deflect that to colleagues in terms of we have no differentiated special guidance on extrapulmonary TB today, um, but we do have it embedded within our broader guidance. Um, so my colleagues who will be at the conference, and if you'd like me to follow up, I can give you a couple of um, contexts for, discuss for discussing um, non-pulmonary forms of TB, um, including childhood forms that are not pulmonary. Uh, thank you. I am again requesting the participants to keep on sending your questions using the chat function or raising your virtual hand. Uh, we have a question for Jose. Uh, in fact, many of the journalists from different countries who are participating right now want to know why is there delay in translating science into public health gains? When will the shortened MDR-TB treatment regimens begin in countries like Indonesia, India, Swaziland. Uh, journalists from these three countries specifically are wanting to know that. Yes, the problem is also, also for instance, when you are thinking in a, in a new drug, no? uh, from the beginning when you are starting with the new drug, with the different clinical trials for the new drug, you need probably around at least five to ten years to show that this drug can work very well in the in the people, in the in the, in the, in the men in the, and in the women. This is the situation with the new drugs. Also, with the same with the shorter regimen for or for the regimen for any disease. The best evidence we have until now is calling the clinical the randomized clinical trial. When some patient, when the same patient, some patient are receiving a, a, a regimen or a drug, another patient are receiving not this regimen. No, this is the situation. No? But to show, especially with MDR, to have a very good RCT, this is calling the randomized clinical trial, you need to wait 
at least five years. And this is the situation. At the beginning, with the call it the shorter regiment, the, the call it Bangladesh regiment, uh, when this regiment started, uh, many, 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 many people thought that the regiment could be the ideal. But you need this regiment at the, at the beginning was showed in a observational study. And to show this is the, the best for all the patients, we need you need to, to wait uh, some years. Because many, many times we can you can see, for instance, this is the situation. At the beginning, Linesolid. I spoke before about Linesolid. We thought that Linesolid was very good, but we were using Linesolid and the same doses we were using for other bacteria. And in this, this doses is very good, but it's also with a very important toxicity, very a very important adverse events. Then uh, it was necessary to show that Linesolid can have the same activity but with less um, adverse events if we are reducing the doses. Then always for this you need to wait five, six years to show that sun implementation can work for all the world. This is probably the situation with the short regimen. WHO needed a very solid evidence, I fully agree, to show to, to recommend for all the world this short regimen. This I think this is the ideal uh, to give to the patient the best regimen and also with the less toxicity. And regarding if this regimen can work in India, Indonesia, and Wasiland, it's something totally sure, totally sure. At that moment, especially in Indonesia, I know very well Indonesia, I had worked in Indonesia and also in India for, for many, many years. Indonesia also is very important, it's probably the best because the probability that the patient with MDR, they can have also resistant to the fluorquinolones or the secular energy table, is very, 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 very little. Is possibility in Indonesia because the uh, probably less than five percent. Then thinking about this, probably more than ninety-five percent of the patients with MDR they can start with this. But remember, uh, I spoke before that the ideal is before the, also the possibility to use the LPA. Remember this diagnosis to test the resistance to the second line drugs to the fluoroquinolone and second line drugs stable. But in Indonesia, in totally sure, more than 90, 95 percent of the patients they will have not is resistant to the second end and therefore this sort of regimen can work very well. In India, also the same, you know, well in India. but in India probably they can have more resistant to this, but of course, sorry because I understand it a lot, uh, this regimen can work in all these countries, sorry. If, if I can add also that um, one of the biggest challenges obviously in rolling out the new drugs has their more operational um, operational um, bottlenecks which we're all trying to address as partners and so working for example in the case of India with the Indian government on the normative front on planning the rollout for the new drugs that has begun um, strategically with the national program and with the diagnostic rollout that's going to be, be able to support um, the selection and use of these new drugs um, for patients. Um, in Swaziland I know that it's also part of a project from Unitaid called the NTB project which is both trying to support research for new regimens but also supporting the rollout of new drugs um, in selected countries I believe they are part of that project um, and in Indonesia clearly with uh, the Indonesian government working with many partners including the Global Fund and the US Agency for International Development and its Challenge TB project is planning strategically both um, you know major um, expansion of access to expert machines for diagnosis as as well as the rollout of new tools. Clearly in some countries there are regulatory bottlenecks in terms of getting the new drugs as Grani has talked about, getting you know, new drugs um, uh, approved for use in country and we want to be sure that we can do all that's possible to make clear that the policy guidance is available for its adequate use and safe use in countries um, and that these drugs have been approved by the European and the US um, drug authorities and therefore should be considered for use by in, and then trying to figure out with entities like the Global Drug Facility and the Bedaclin Donation Program of the U.S. government, how you overcome the bottlenecks and, and safely plan for the rollout of these new tr drugs um, for full supply to the patients that need them. Because the worst scenario is for people to get partial regimens. We want them to get the full regimens they need as we move to whether the shorter regimen or um, new the newer drugs for for um, single drugs um, in the use of MDR regimens for patients that meet the criteria. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, we have a question for Grania uh, from Aarti Dhar. She is a very senior journalist from India. 
uh, she wants to have more details about the 3P project, like which stage of research is it in, when will the therapy be available for public, and is India part of the research. Granny, I would request you to ex introduce 3P briefly uh, to our participants. No problem. So, so the 3P project is um, is is a new and innovative way of doing research and development in TB. So, as yet, it is um, it is in a uh, it's yet to be launched. We have spent the last year or so working with a number of partners, including uh, the Union, the TB Alliance, uh, the World Health Organization, um, the Stop TB Partnership. Uh, Medicines Patent Pool and the Critical Path Institute in looking to see um, sort of what the needs are in TBR and D. So not only do we know that there's systemically underfunding in TBR and D, probably only about a third is what is being invested with what uh, compared to what we need to get the new tools for um, treating and preventing TB. But in fact. The whole system, we feel, is not actually answering the, 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 the needs. So the way that TB research is, TB drug research is performed now is that is promoting the development of drugs, which is a good thing. But actually, what we need for TB is development of regimens. So we are in the situation now where we have two new two new drugs, which is good, but in fact we haven't been use them in entirely new regimens and so the regimen trials for these new drugs which some of the results or sort of will be talked about at the union haven't really begun properly um, and therefore um, we're adding them into the background regimen that is long and toxic with side effects. The way the 3P project is going to work is that by using these mechanisms of push, pull and pooling, so really by awarding a prize at phase one for any new drug that comes into the TB pipeline um, and then at that stage pooling all the IP and data on its use in TB so that it's available for anyone wanting to do regimen research and at that stage from phase two in the pipeline, you we would make grant funding available for, for regimen trials so that um, what we get is new drugs being developed in regimen so that at the end of the pipeline, A, the process is a lot faster and B, we have a whole new regimen uh, available to treat all forms of TB. So it is yet to launch, but the aim is that within the next year we get sufficient funding to be able to launch the 3P project with all the partners, um, and then the uh, we predict and we hope that within 10 years, hopefully shorter, but within 10 years we would be getting an entirely new regimen to treat all forms of TB with the aim of it being one month or less. Uh, thanks, thanks, Grania. Uh, let's hope for the best so that by 2030 we are able to really end the epidemic. Uh, we have a question from uh, a journalist from Bangladesh uh, for Jose. Uh, she says that the loss to follow up rate of new TB patients is around 5% and of recurrent TB is around 20% and in case of MDR TB around 25% loss to follow up should be zero. So how can we reduce these existing rates to, of loss to follow up? Uh, if we, uh, the, we have only, the, the problem with the loss to follow up with the um, current DRTB regimen is the toxicity. And you have to give, for instance, you are starting this regimen at three months, usually most of the patients, they, they, they have improved a lot, a lot, a lot, and most of them, they have no symptoms. Then after three months, they need to take 18 months more with one ingestible for around four, five, six months late more. And also a lot of toxic drugs like ethionamide or proteonamide, vomiting a lot, and also cyclosine with psychiatric problems. The problem is for the reason the patient, when they are improving, and after six, seven months, they are mm, defaulting. 
It's very logical. If you are analyzing the why the patient are lost to follow up, most of them is after they 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 are better, they are improving, and after the smear and culture conversion. For the reason we need we need to reduce the time. And at that moment, the, the current shorter regimen, 9 12 month regimen, is improving the success rate, not because the regimen is better, it's improving because the regimen is shorter. And the, with the shorter, you have the same rate of relapse as the other. Then the, the only way at that moment to reduce the loss to follow up is to reduce the time to follow up. This is what the same with the prerefundation period. Before refundation period, all the regimens, they needed 18 months. And at the moment, we were the same, the defaulter, the loss to follow up was the 20-25%. Only when refundation came to the, to the world of the TV and the regimen could reduce to nine months, the loss, loss to follow up were reduced also to around 5-6%. Then the only possibility at the moment is to reduce the time. In the very near, near uh, future, also we, we will reduce to six months with the new drugs. And with the new drugs, the, the tolerance is very, very well. Also, we can reduce even more the loss to follow up. Thank you. My sincere thanks to all the panelists and the participants for being with us today. We have come to the end of our webinar. Uh, as always, we will be sending the participants the audio podcast and video recording of the webinar. Um, I wish all of you a very happy Diwali. A festival which is celebrated in India. It will be celebrated in the last week of October, which signifies the winning of truth over evil, good over evil, and the conquest of truth over lies. Also, wishing the union a very successful and meaningful conference in Liverpool. Uh, have a good day. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.